Hey there, and welcome. My name's Chris from Swatera Media. I began learning how to do visual effects about seven years ago. One of the first shots I ever pulled off was this city destruction shot. I wouldn't have been able to do so without the amazing city destruction tutorial for After Effects by Andrew Kramer from Video Copilot. Not only did he teach me and millions of others how to do this, but he's inspired so many visual effects artists and filmmakers. So let's learn how to do this same effect, but in Fusion. You could think of it like the tutorial version of covering a song. We'll approach it in a similar way to how Andrew did it in his, while also doing some extra things here and there. This was made with all the love in the world for the original. So let's get started. So to begin, we'll need some footage. In my case, I was actually able to find the original 4K red footage of the same scene from the Andrew Kramer tutorial. Due to licensing, I won't be able to share this, but I've included a link in the description uh, to the footage on Storyblocks as well as links to other footage that would work well. Any drone shot that gets reasonably close to buildings would work. I've also included several assets for download to help you along, some of which were generated using Stable Diffusion. So those are fair game and you can use them as you'd like. The project file itself can be found on the Patreon if you want to dig further into the nodes. So I haven't done a ton to this footage. The main thing I've done is applied a little bit of color correction. Um, it had a bit of a green haze to it uh, originally. And I've also exported it from its original uh, raw red files into a uh, ProRes file. It's a little bit faster to, for DaVinci Resolve to decode. So what we can do now is just jump right into Fusion, either by hitting the Fusion tab here, or right-clicking and choosing Open in Fusion page. Now our first step will be to create a 3D camera solve of the scene. The idea here is we're going to tell Fusion to track a bunch of points on the footage. From those points, Fusion will be able to figure out how the camera moved in 3D space. We'll then end up with a 3D representation of the scene which will allow us to place objects in it. There are other methods that are used in the film and television industry, but we won't be covering those here. This all forms the basis of match moving. Now, if you're doing this for a film or a TV, one step that we will be skipping for now is removing lens distortion. I may make a tutorial that goes deeper into the camera tracker where we will cover it, but if we're making things for fun like this, it's okay to let the tracker figure that out for us. Now the first step whenever you want to match move a scene is to assess it and figure out any potential challenges you might run into. If we're trying to match move and the end goal of our shot is to attach elements to the buildings, we're in good shape. They're clearly defined and not moving too fast. One big problem though are the cars. As you'll see, Fusion has some great tools for filtering out problematic tracking points, but it's always good to remove anything from your scene that isn't stationary. Now to do this, there are multiple ways. I personally prefer to use Mocha Pro for a task like this, but we can check out some other approaches. One option is to simply create a mask and manually animate it. You wanna make sure to not create too many points as it can get unruly. And you basically go through and animate that over time. So I'm just selecting it and moving it. We wanna make sure to, uh, to pay attention to any changes in perspective so we can change the shape accordingly. And you also wanna keep it pretty close because we, we don't wanna to eliminate too much of the footage. So that's one way to do it. Now an option that's a little bit faster is to use the planar tracker. I'll, go, I'll find a good planar tracker video um, and link it here. Might end up being mine, I think I've covered it, but I'll double check. Now in my testing, um, I found that the footage was actually pretty good. Um, sometimes you might need to put a corrector in front of it to kind of give it more contrast or add some sharpening, but um, in this case I didn't find uh, anything to be very problematic at all. Now what we'll want to do, we'll take the output of our media in, and put that on the input of the camera tracker, and we're going to take our mask images and attach that to the mask input on the camera tracker and we'll make that active. We're gonna enable preview auto track locations. 
Now there's a lot to go over on the camera tracker. And like I said, I might make a tutorial about that specifically, but um, I'll go over everything that's relevant to this briefly. So the detection threshold essentially determines how picky the camera tracker is when it's creating points to track. So when this is increased, you'll see the number of points decreasing. So raising this will give you higher quality, but fewer tracks overall. Having more tracks makes it a bit easier when we get to the 3D portion of the scene. For this one, I'm going to just leave that at 2.2. Now the minimum feature separation will basically tell it to lay down more points. So if I move this to the left, see there's more points showing up. I might actually, in this case, lower this threshold a little bit. We do want quite a few points. Now the more points that you have, the longer this is going to take. Um, so it does depend on your computer's hardware and on all of that. But in addition to this workstation, I also have an M1 MacBook Pro, and that's able to handle a decent amount of points. So your mileage may vary. Now the next thing, we want to make sure that we have bi-directional tracking turned on. That just means it's going to go through the entire timeline forward and then track again backwards. And that generally results in better tracks. So we're ready, and we'll hit auto track. Awesome. So that went through no problem at all. Now I'm going to touch on the camera section for a moment. This section is used when the information about the camera is available. This information helps the camera tracker to better understand the optics and sensor size of the camera, which aids in solving the scene. In this case, the footage came from a stock site, which didn't provide the camera information aside from it being a red camera, but you know, they make a bunch of different cameras. And we also don't know what kind of lens was used on it. In cases like these, it's okay to let Fusion try to figure this out. If you have this information though, you'll want to enter as much of it as you can here. If you find yourself working on a professional production, all this information is going to be provided to you, and then some, ideally. So now we'll come over to the Solve tab. It looks like we've ended up with a uh, huge number of points, as you can see here. Fusion Solver can take some time to crunch in the numbers, so we'll want to try to cull these points as much as we can. To do this, we'll find the minimum track error slider and begin to lower that. Now what's happening here is all of these tracking points have an individual track error. All we're doing is filtering out any points that have a track error above what we set. So in this case, it's 0 0.099. Anything above that, we're telling it to highlight. Now, we we'll want to be mindful not to remove too many points. We also want to make sure we're not removing too many points from objects we might want to work on, like these buildings here. Um, it's a delicate balance, so we'll work on it carefully. So we can probably get away with eliminating roughly two thirds of the points. So we'll go ahead and click delete. Once we've done that, let's click solve. This is the part that can take some time. You might want to go make a coffee while fusion crunches these numbers. The progress will be kind of vague, but it's just a matter of waiting. If an error pops up warning that you don't have enough points to solve the scene, undo using control or command Z and try eliminating fewer points. All right, so the solve finished. It didn't take too long on my end, um, but it looks like we ended up with a really good solve error right out of the gate. So in my case, we're looking at point eight six, um, which is actually really good. It's one that we could probably actually roll with, but um, 
I always like to get the track error as low as humanly possible. Um, oh, sorry, I should say the solve error. So in this case, we're going to be working with the solve error slider. So what I'm going to do is just remove some of those. Now, one thing that you can take, you can notice here. Let me pull this back a little bit. Some of these have quite a high solve error. So what we'll want to do is kind of make sure that um, you can begin by simply highlighting most or all of the um, tracking points that are either yellow, dark orange, or red. And that'll kind of allow you to remove the most problematic points. So we'll start there. So I'll move this solve error down. And I'll make sure that I have a bunch of those selected. I'm going to delete them. And then we're going to solve again. Oh, man. Yes. So it looks like now we're down to a solve error of 0.3. You could take it further. In this case, for our purposes here today, that's going to be fantastic. That's going to give us, if we're able to align our geometry properly, we're going to get a rock solid uh, track and things that we place in our 3d scene are going to stay put and now what we'll want to do is make sure that our scene is aligned properly we'll come over to our export tab and we'll say we'll click export so now we'll get these nodes here and we'll kind of just want to move them aside and let's give our st ourselves a little bit of room we'll move this media in or this sorry this media out over pretty far we're going to be uh, getting up to some stuff, so we'll just want some room for uh, what we're doing. And what we'll do is we'll make our uh, Merge 3D1 active. Now the controls can be a little bit odd if you're used to um, other 3D software. I'm not sure which one they base this off of, but I've never um, used any quite like it. So. To move up and down, I'm using my middle mouse button here, my middle mouse wheel. To rotate, I'm holding down Alt and clicking with the middle mouse button. And to uh, dolly in and out, I'm holding down Control and use, scrolling my middle mouse wheel. Now, one thing that we're seeing here is it looks like our scene is a little out of whack. So if we notice here, um, our camera is a little big with um, in relation to these uh, buildings here. Generally speaking, when you work in 3D, you want to try to work in real world scale. Now, obviously, this is would be an enormous scene. For our purposes here, um, most of this doesn't matter too much. Um, the only thing is, if we don't align these buildings to this grid here, it's going to be a little awkward when we're placing our uh, objects. So we're going to try our best to align this scene properly. Now what we'll do to try to save some time um, at first is uh, we'll go ahead and make the camera tracker active in the viewport again. And we're going to find some points and we're going to select those. We're going to click unaligned under the 3d scene transform and for the orientation we want to make sure the selection is set to the ground and we'll click set from selection now another thing that we'll do to make life a little bit easier is this uh, front building here is actually like the main building um, we're going to be doing the bulk of the work on so we'll click on one of these points here because i think if we go uh, I think we might want to put our damage about there. And under origin, we'll click set from selection. Now for the scale for my testing, I found that a value of 20 was sufficient. So we'll click on aligned. And then we'll say update previous export. Now let's see how it looks. Now it looks like it did an okay job of lining it up. Now they do look a little odd. Um, that could be because we didn't um, fix the lens distortion. But I think for our purposes here today, this is going to be just fine. 
We're not doing anything too crazy. Now, once I get to this point, um, whether it's in Fusion or in Nuke or 3D Equalizer or you know any of the software that's used for match moving, I'd like to attach a quick object to whatever we'll be placing an object on. In this case, the front of this building. So in our Merge 3D, what we'll do is right click and go to Camera and then Camera 3D. All right, so we do want to be careful here because those points that are further in the distance, they're not being masked out by these points in the front. So we want to make sure that we're not selecting any points that are further back. And you can tell pretty easily just by kind of scrolling through. And also the points in front will be quite a bit bigger. So what we'll do is start by grabbing a few of these. Also want to double check that they're looking good in terms of perspective. All right, and then with those points selected, we'll right click and choose Point Cloud 3D1 and then Create Image Plane. So Fusion's gonna do its best to align that plane there for us. So to check it out, um, what we'll do is right click and our camera, we're gonna switch to Perspective. That's looking pretty good. It's a little bit off, I think, in the X axis. So we'll go ahead and make that change. So we'll come into our image plane 3D and transform. And we'll rotate Oh, so for some reason our X is up in the case of this image plane. So what we'll do is we'll adjust our Y rotation. And to make this a little bit more precise, you can hold down shift and drag over the top of the number. Now it may need a little bit of help in the X as well. So we'll rotate that very slightly. Now this may be different for yours because um, it's going to track different points. And this is just a matter of, in this case, trial and error. So we'll bring this down. And what we'll also do is we'll grab a second viewer and that is by clicking on this button up here. And let's take a look at how we're looking over here too at the same time. We'll make this plane just a bit bigger. A little taller, a little wider. Yeah, something isn't quite lining up perspective wise because we would expect that these this would be a straight line across. So I think it would be our X rotation in this case. So we can make sure that that's lined up. Um, one thing I also like to do is drop down a checker texture. Now this is part of uh, Reactor. I'll include a link in the description and a link above on how to install that. And then we just attach the output of that into the material input on our image plane 3D. And what I'll do, I'm going to adjust the aspect so that we end up with cubes. First I'll up the repeats. Maybe put that to eight. Perfect. And this will just allow me to take a look at certain points so I might actually adjust that a bit. But once we get that, we're going to play this back and check and see how it's doing. See how that placement is. We're going to want to watch out for unwanted shifts in perspective because that'll tell us that it's not aligned properly. Oops. 
so far so good. And what I'm doing more or less when I uh, assess these is I'm locking onto one point, maybe this right here, and seeing where that point is. Because if we're putting something attached to this building, these shouldn't move at all. There should be no movement. So when we put this here, and you could even start with a point that's a little lower so you can see it from start to finish. So if we take a look at this point here, it's kind of right on the edge. We kind of see that pattern there. We'll follow it and follow it. We are seeing it move very slightly. So what that's telling me is it's off, but not by much. Now we're also zoomed to 337%. <laughs> when you do stuff like this, it, you know, for clients and people like that, it needs to be exact. So let's take a look over here. Now it's possible that it might be, let's see if that's revealing, that means it should be, we might need to just move it forward a little bit on the Z axis. Actually, let's, I would, actually that where you would need to move it back. Now let's check that out. Now I'm actually going to grab one at the corner and make it a little bit easier to follow. This one's good. And that's holding on nice, yeah. So I think we have a good um, alignment here. And now what we'll do is kind of get a big picture. We'll make this the main viewer. And we'll load as much of this as we can into RAM. I don't know about you, but I think that's looking pretty good. It does look a little odd because it doesn't have any um, motion blur on it or anything like that. But I think for what we're doing, I think that's going to be a good alignment. All right, now that we have everything aligned on that plane, I went ahead and did the same thing for these two buildings in the back here. I was just thinking I might want to add a little bit of a destruction to these guys as well. This is, of course, optional. This is, of course, optional, but it can really add some more uh, intensity to your scene. So now what we can do is begin to construct the textures that we're going to replace these little checker patterns with. In the description, I've added a link to a whole folder full of these destruction images. And let me make these a little bit bigger. So these were created uh, using stable diffusion. So these aren't real images, uh, but the nice thing about that is you can use these to your heart's content. Now, I believe I picked out one or two that I really liked. And let me find the other one. I think it was 50 something, 55. Yep. So what I'm going to do is drag this first asset into my node tree. And we're going to be working with the front building here. Now down here, I just kind of cleaned things up a little bit. I added labels so we can kind of keep track of everything. And let's go ahead and we'll move this over and we'll make this active. So I actually had a really hard time uh, getting the AI to understand the concept of a uh, photo straight on. Now there are some here that would work really well, but they're kind of a little off angle. But one thing that you can do is open those up into Photoshop if you have it. And there's a um, perspective warp tool that allow you to kind of manipulate the perspective a bit. So these do have some hard edges. We don't want that. We want everything to kind of blend nicely. So we're gonna grab a polygon tool and we won't connect it just yet. We wanna be able to see our image here. 
Um, so we'll just uh, click and kind of create like an organic kind of shape. We don't want anything too normal looking. We want it to kind of be wavy and weird and wacky. And you can kind of um, experiment a little bit with this. Just add some stuff there. And what we're also going to do is we're going to click over here and disable the animation. We don't want, if we want to make changes to this mask later, we don't want it to move over time. That'd be completely unnatural. So then we'll connect the output of this and the input of our image. And we get that. We'll probably want to feather the edges a little bit. So we'll just uh, bring up that soft edge. Cool. And now we'll switch over to our camera tracker renderer. We'll go ahead and disconnect the checker node and we'll uh, put in, plug in the uh, material into the input on our plane. That looks like the aspect ratio is a little off, so we'll go ahead and drop down a transform node and we'll go ahead and adjust the aspect ratio until it looks normal. Now you can also do your best to try to align the windows as well, kind of make it a little bit more realistic. Now let's get a preview. So I have moved our destruction down a little bit um, for reasons that will be clear a little later on. But let's take a look and see how it looks. All right, so that's looking pretty good. Aside from uh, not being uh, composited in properly at all, but that's okay, that's something we'll get to. So one thing I'm seeing, I kind of want to adjust that mask a little bit. So let's open up a second viewer. We're going to make our media pool a little smaller. So on the right, we'll have our camera tracker renderer. And on the left, we'll have our shape. So now we can start, I'm just going to start moving these in a little bit. At the moment, it's a little more, a little longer, or taller, I should say. I kind of want to make it a little more like a hole in the building, a rounded hole. I will just kind of adjust these. Since I want it to be chaotic, I'm not paying very much attention at all to how these handles are. We will bring this down a little bit further. Yeah. And then we'll pull this up. I think that's looking a little bit better. So it's looking good, but at the moment things are a bit flat. You know, it looks like it's a poster of destruction just kind of plastered on the side of the building here. So to remedy that, we're just going to take a advantage of a bit of parallax. And I'll show you what I mean. So I'm first going to grab another uh, destruction asset here. It looks like this. So it's kind of like a big, giant hole in the side of this building here. And similarly to before, we're just going to take a polygon node and we're going to mask out kind of the shape that we want. And I'm just going a little bit crazy here. Same as before, we'll mask it and then we'll feather it. And what we're going to do is we're going to duplicate this plane here that our current material is sitting on. So we'll control C or command C and control or command V. We'll call this front building inset. And we'll go ahead and connect that up. So now we see our uh, shape here. Let's enter our uh, merge 3D. Make sure we're in perspective. So right now we have the front plane with that destruction on it. Now what we're going to do is we're going to make it look like there's a deeper hole so that when that way when the camera moves past it, you get that parallax and it kind of makes you think that you're looking inside the building, inside of the destruction. So let's grab that and we're going to just 
move it back in the Z axis. So now we see that one is in front of the other. And that's something we'll probably adjust and change a bit. Now to make this work, we're going to need to adjust the mask on our first shape. So we're going to grab another polygon tool and we're going to draw a hole. We're going to invert this mask and we'll connect it to our uh, first polygon node. Now on our second, on our first polygon node, we're going to change the paint mode to minimum. So now we have this hole in it. We'll go ahead and feather that. A little more oddly shaped. So now if we look, our destruction has a big hole in it. So our next step is to attach this second material to our duplicated copy of that front plane. And now we'll of course run into the same <laughs> sort of issue with the aspect ratio. Now there are better ways in 3D to handle this, but we're just gonna do it the, the brute force simple way. And we'll go ahead and change that aspect ratio to where it makes sense. Now at this point, it might be good to switch over to our camera tracker so we can kind of see it a little bit better. So it's a little too tall, a little too big. We'll lower that aspect some more. Now, one thing that's helpful in order to make sure that we have everything kind of lining up the right way and that we don't have any, because we want all of this second material to be behind our first one. So we don't want any of it coming out the sides because it'll look weird. So we'll go ahead and drop down a color corrector node. And we're just going to change it like to some extreme color like pink or red or orange. And then we'll keep going. Now we can also use these uh, transform tools in here because it's going along that local axis. So that's something that we can take advantage of. Now we'll lower it down. Now we do see some of it sticking off the sides here. Um, one possible solution for that would be to make this a little bit wider, especially in spots where we're uh, having some issues. And we'll kind of move things out here while still kind of maintaining the general look we're going for. I still see a little tiny bit. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So we'll uh, enable pass through on this color corrector node by uh, control or command P. So that way we can see it in its normal colors. And let's take a look and get a preview and see how it's, how it's looking. All right, so it's really subtle, but I bet you can spot it. Just that one little addition really makes it feel like there's a hole in it that you could reach inside the building. Now this can be repeated as many times as you'd like. And I think what we'll do is, you know, find one more. Maybe some smaller debris. Let's see what this one looks like. Yeah. Kind of add another layer of debris to it. Especially this portion up here. If we isolate, kind of cut out the middle, and maybe we can add a plane in between the two. Or maybe move the, the second one back a little bit further and put another one in between. So let's do that. So, just like before, we'll duplicate this plane again, pop into our merge 3D. And I think what we'll do is we'll move this one back just slightly. So we did all those adjustments. We don't want to throw things off too much. And we'll make, bring this one forward. And now we'll grab our new one 
And I think what we might do is just steal these polygon nodes up here because they're roughly the shape that we want already. And we'll plug those into this one and we'll just make some adjustments to it. So we, we know that we want to bring in this because we have that the wrong perspective on the outside there. And this is why I included pretty pretty much all the images that Stable Diffusion generated. Um, I think I set it to generate about 500 of these overnight. And you came back with, I culled them down to about 137 workable ones. But even ones that aren't perfect are usable because you can use it for stuff like this. You can kind of grab some of this grunge. We move that in. And then what we'll do is we'll connect it. Oh, I think what we forgot is to, no, I did move it. Cool. So we'll go ahead and connect that. And we'll rename this because we always want to be renaming our stuff. It's three, but it's in the middle. That's okay. I'll be honest with you. Most of the time I don't even label these. <laughs> I'm usually working pretty much solo, so. All right, let's take a look at how that's looking. Now, of course, we have our aspect ratio to work with. So let's drop down another transform node. And we'll work with that aspect there. Bring this in. We'll make this pretty low and then we'll move the Y down. Yeah. All right, let's get a preview on this one. And that is looking pretty good. It just really adds some depth to it. Absolutely love it. All right, now through the magic of editing, I've uh, kind of cleaned things up a little bit, added an underlay for our front building elements. And what we're gonna do next should be a lot of fun. So in the description, amongst all the project files, you'll find a couple of image sequences. And what we're gonna do with these is add smoke and fire inside our uh, hole in the building. Very simple. We're just going to copy our building plane. We'll rename this one. We'll start with the fire because it's the coolest. Uh, fire. And we'll go ahead and attach this. We'll hop into Merge 3D so we can kind of position this where we want. I'm going to have it kind of more uh, towards the front. So we'll pull this forward in Z space. That should be good. And now we'll bring in our fire sequence. Let's take a quick peek at it. So this isn't the highest quality um, fire simulation. Just made this in Embergen real quick on very basic settings. But far away, it'll look fine. Now, we notice I rendered the whole simulation, so it also starts with the beginning where it isn't quite complete. So we'll go ahead and we'll find when it's strongest, and we'll trim that. So we'll go ahead and trim. Perfect. I will plug that into the material input on the fire. Let's head over to our camera tracker renderer. And of course, not in the right place and the aspect ratio is all wrong. Not a problem. We'll drop down a transform node. And we'll move this up. Now the base is a little flat, so we don't want that to be visible. And we'll adjust that aspect ratio. It's a little too high. Let's bring that down. And let's get a quick peek at how that's looking. All right, so that's looking pretty darn good. Now. From this distance, it's fine. If this was a bigger element, um, I would probably export this camera data and bring that into Embergen or Houdini or whatever you're using for your simulations. 
and that'll make things look a little bit nicer, but you know, I think that looks pretty good. So now we're going to do it again. Oops. So we'll paste that one more time, make our underlay a little bit bigger, and we'll bring in our smoke sequence. So it's a similar thing, just a bit of smoke to fill things out. Now, if you're in the midst of building a VFX shot, one thing that can help things is to layer and layer and layer. So add more, add more elements to it to kind of make things a little more interesting. Now, of course, don't overdo it. We, you know, generally speaking, when we do VFX, we want to do it in a photorealistic way that, you know, more or less makes sense in the real world. But if you think find things are a little bit flat, that's a great way to start, you know, making your scene a little more interesting. So we'll go ahead and we'll go in here once more. And this one, we're going to push a little further back. So that'll be all the way back there. And we'll switch back over to get a look at it. And similar to before, we want to cut out the beginning portion when the simulation is just starting. That should be good. So we trim that back. And of course our aspect ratio will be wrong. I think it should be pretty similar. So we should be able to copy this transform. We'll bring this down. All right, so I think things are looking pretty good. What we'll need to do now is color match this. So we'll start with this most outer damage. We'll start to work on that. So that's gonna be our first one here, our outer damage. So we'll drop down a color correction node. Now, since we're working with um, something that has transparency, we'll wanna come up into the options and choose pre-divide post multiply. I'm not going to go into why that's important. Um, it is just very important that you pre-malt um, your images after you've uh, made adjustments to them. There are plenty of videos out there that go into uh, great detail about how to how pre-multiplication and um, unpre-multiplication work. And they'll explain things a little bit better than I will. I don't have too much time for that today. All right, so one thing straight away um, the most um, we're seeing is uh, this is quite a bit more saturated uh, than our footage. So we're going to want to bring that down quite a bit. It also kind of has a, a blue or cast to it. So we'll kind of drag this over and move it into the blues. And we'll also start to get this uh, gain down here. And we're already starting to get pretty close. We're going to lift it just a bit. So I'm looking at how it looks inside these windows. This is exposed and not reflecting light. So this will be a bit darker. We'll kind of use that as our guide. I'm gonna bring back a little bit of saturation, just a tad. Now this isn't going to involve any mind blowing compositing but we're going to get it pretty close and one thing we can do to save time let's go ahead and we'll paste that onto our other damage and we'll paste it one more time because that should at least get us into the ballpark and the thing what I'm going to do is Lower this soft edge a bit. Now what I'm seeing is there's a bit of a red cast in the shadows and somewhat 
uh, looks like in the midtones as well. So we're going to drop down another corrector. And we're going to switch this to shadows. I'm going to punch in a little bit of green. Not too much green. <laughs> Now this will vary a lot because um, if you choose to go with different uh, destruction assets, this might look completely different from yours. We'll go ahead and we'll copy that second one. Now I think that's looking pretty good. It could be closer, but I think given the distance, I think that's blending in pretty well. Now next we'll want to work on the fire. Also, I want to make sure that all of these have our pre-divide post multiply enabled. I think these should. Yep. Yeah. All right. And let's drop down a corrector for our fire. And we'll enable pre-divide post multiply. And now the scene is a bit dim. So we always want to be referencing the rest of our scene and taking a look at where the brightest highlights are and how are they looking. And we want to be able to match that. We don't want to make anything too bright. And I think what we'll do is gamma this down a bit. And it's also too saturated. And what I might want to do is kind of punch up the highlights a bit. I think we're looking good there. Let's see how things are looking with the color matching. And I think that's looking pretty good. All right. Now, one thing that we'll also need to do is defocus this. So right now it is way too sharp. So we'll add in a defocus node. We'll start with the outside and we'll defocus that until it is correct. Oh, we don't want a lot of bloom. And then I think that's looking pretty close. So we'll copy and paste that to each. Now, one thing you can do to make life a little easier, if you need to make more adjustments, so we'll start here, we'll pin this one Pin this one, and so on, and so on. Oops. Pin, pin. We'll pin all of these. We'll come down to, let's see, where is to focus one? And let's right click on defocus size, choose expression, and connect that to defocus one. Same for this one. Set expression, connect that to the defocus size. Same with this one, and connect that to defocus one. So now they should all be connected to it. Oh, forgot this guy up here. Expression, and connect to defocus one. So now, when we change to focus one, they all change. And there you go. So that way, if you need to make changes to all of them, now they are all connected. And one thing we'll do at the end too is also enable motion blur. But right now we are um, computing a lot of stuff and we don't want to have to add on to that more than we need to. Okay. All righty. So I've gone ahead and done some stuff off camera. So let's just skip ahead here a little bit. So I've added destruction to these two buildings. It's the same exact process. You go into the merge 3D and place the planes and um, kind of move them in Z space through the whole thing. Same exact process. There's absolutely no difference between these two and the first one. Now, if you find in your track that you have access, that it's tracked enough points on other buildings to add more stuff, you can demolish this place as much as you'd like. Now, I've also done a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you might notice a little bit of a difference in the way 
I have the node set up and let me explain exactly what's going on here and why I did it. So I was having some rendering issues with the uh, camera tracker renderer. Um, some of the elements were flickering. So what I did is all I've done here is duplicated the merge 3D and the camera 3D. I've pasted those and I've put them in their own little instances. And then I've put those into their own camera tracker renderers. Those are then being merged over top of one another using regular old uh, merge nodes after the camera tracker renderer. And then finally, and I'll actually probably move this up here to make it make more sense. And then finally here I have our footage uh, underneath of our VFX elements. So that's merging our elements over top of the footage. And the big reason I did that, actually, is so we can add grain. So one of the most important things is matching the grain of the original footage. Now this one doesn't have a ton of it. This process, there's ways to do it where it's a lot more intricate and a lot more accurate. Um, but here we're just gonna kind of eyeball it. So what we'll do is we'll lower that strength. And that should be good. There isn't a whole lot of noise anyway, but we want to add a bit of it so that way it looks a little bit more realistic. So we've got that film grain, we've got that merging over top of our footage. Now, one problem we're running into, our VFX elements are cutting into the building. The simple solution to that is to rotoscope. Now, this isn't a rotoscoping tutorial, um, so I'm not going to go into how to do that. I prefer to use uh, Silhouette for rotoscoping, which is a great program for rotoscoping made by Boris FX, not a sponsor, but they could be. So I'm gonna skip ahead to where I have my masks made. All right, I lied a little bit. I actually ended up using Mocha because it was a very simple rotoscope, but now we have, I have my masks here and that's plugged into the merge node where the footage comes in. So now we have things masked. I'll probably want to soften that edge up a little bit. Now there are a couple of things that uh, Andrew Kramer did in the original tutorial that, you know, I think we've established the main idea of how these things are done, that you'd be able to do them yourself as well. Now, what I would recommend is if you want to see the things that he did that weren't done in this video, I'd recommend watching that tutorial and I'll link it below as well. Now, one thing that um, he did that wasn't directly covered in this video is he took a still frame of this highway here and he added a lot of damage to it. So he got rid of a lot of the cars, added cracks to the highway and things like that. This is already going to be a long tutorial. And honestly, I want an excuse for you to go and watch his. Give him some views. Not that he needs them, <laughs> but as this is an ode to that, I want to spread the love around. One of the things that he does is add some uh, damage up here to the top of the building. Um, one thing he also does is uses a still frame and draws back in some of these uh, vertical or horizontal beams here um, to kind of give it even more depth. Now there is something that we are going to do that wasn't covered. Now this file is included in the description in the link there. What I did was I took the 3D camera that we created and I imported that into Embergen. And I was able to create an explosion. And what we're going to do is add that explosion and also do our best to animate in that hole. So we're gonna mask the hole and make it look like the explosion created that hole. So we'll do that to wrap things up. So first we'll get our explosion in place, drop down a merge node, and we'll plug that into the foreground. So by default, it should be doing everything correctly. Now, if you drop down this sequence, it's actually an, uh, an open EXR sequence. So it might not always import correctly. If it turns red on you, go into the media in node, go to channels, and we need to switch these accordingly. So we have the red channel. We wanna choose red, green, blue, and alpha. 
Now, the first thing we'll do is just start by correcting this just a little bit. So we know it's too saturated. A little too contrasty too. We'll lower the gain a bit. Maybe give it a little, little bit of lift. We want to take note of the shadows. We want to make sure that those um, dark parts of the explosion are not exceeding the darkest parts of the image. And that's a good start. We'll make more changes to it as we go on. Now the good thing is it looks like it's completely covering our a hole here, which is fantastic. Now what we'll also do is bring in another thing that I made. This was just in Blender, just a really, really simple debris sequence. We'll put that before our explosion. So this will be underneath it. And what this is, and I think this is not 4K, so we'll want a resize node. There we go. And we'll drop down a color correct node because those end up being a little bit more dim. Um, we'll bring up our gain a bit. Yeah, that's looking good. So now we have our explosion in place, but we don't want all of this to be here at the beginning. So we're going to find the frame where the explosion appears. Okay, so it looks like it's 28. Now the simplest way to do this would be to just create a mask that expands with this explosion. And we'll use some trickery to kind of cover it up because it's not gonna look right. The way you'd actually do this is in something like Houdini where you'd actually simulate the building actually exploding. But well, we're not doing that. We're kind of taking the kind of a simpler approach. But we should be able to cover our sins using this explosion. So what we're going to do, in order to be able to mask all this business here, we'll drop down a background node. We'll turn off the alpha, grab a merge. So what we'll do is connect the background node to the background and put on that merge node. Now this is the foreground. And now what we can do is mask it. So we'll grab our, I think we can get away with just using a simple elliptical mask. Now, one of the things I don't like is not being able to kind of link these two numbers, but what we can do is uh, use an expression and connect the width to the height. So now we can make this same size. So we'll make this nice and small. So I'll actually make it zero. Plug that in. So now that we've got these two connected, we'll go ahead and plug that in. And I actually made a mistake. And I leave these mistakes in here just to educate. I put it before the camera tracker node, which doesn't make a lick of sense. So we'll go ahead and disconnect those and we'll connect those up properly. Now we'll go to the end. There we go. So now our building is masked. And what we'll do is make this zero. So now we just have our building and the explosion. So this frame that we're on is where we want this expansion to begin. So we will find our ellipse node and set a keyframe for these two. Now, since that's in 3D space, we're going to have to animate the uh, ellipse's movement as well. So we'll keyframe the center and move that down. We'll move forward a couple frames. Just kind of keep going with it down here. At no point do we want to exceed the 
outside of the explosion. And now we want to kind of start to slowly, and we'll give this a nice soft edge too. We're going to expand it outward bit by bit. Now this is all happening over a couple moments, a couple seconds. So this will happen pretty quick. And now I think at this point we should be good to expand it all the way out. So now what we'll do is attempt to get some playback on that. Okay. I'm quickly running out of RAM. <laughs> I'm currently at like they're almost 30 gigs <laughs> to load that. So I think we'll stop there as far as that goes. I think it's looking pretty good. I think the smoke fire the smokes a little too lifted. Let's bring that back down. Yeah, there we go. And one thing we can do to kind of just sweeten this comp just a little bit, um, I think it'd be nice to add some exponential glow to this. So that way it looks like it's casting light onto the building. So we'll go ahead and do that. I think I mentioned before how to download and um, install reactor. That's uh, in the uh, description. I'll link to that video. So let's enable XGlow. That's going to look a little crazy. We'll change that threshold. Kind of adjust things a bit, make that glow size a little bit bigger. Bring that down a bit. So we've got our X glow and it's looking pretty good, but typically you'll want to kind of double up your glow. So this one was, this first one was a bit more large, kind of spreading out a bit more. And this next one, we're going to make, make it do something interesting. So add another X glow and let's come back to the first frame where we see the explosion happen. So we'll pull the threshold back just like we did before. We'll up the gain and we'll set a keyframe on the gain. And then we'll go ahead quite a ways and we'll drop it down some. Now in this case, with all of this happening, even on my machine, I don't think we're gonna get a playback on that one. So we're gonna call that done. We're gonna roll with it. Whatever comes out, I'm just gonna roll with it. And now, finally, we'll locate our media out and we'll connect that up. Now it's a little stylized, a little exaggerated, but that's okay. We're just having fun here. Now, what I would recommend doing is not working off of this as is. I often like to just hold down Alt or Option and we're going to duplicate this. It might take a second. Now once that's duplicated, we'll disable the bottom one so it's not processing it. And then we'll render this in place. I prefer to use DNX HR and we'll hit render and we'll save a nice, we'll save it in a place with plenty of storage. And then we'll wait for a while. And also one thing I had forgotten to mention you can also uh, right click on any node that you want and choose cache to disk. So it'll choose, you'll choose a place to put it and that'll basically go ahead and cache out everything up to that node. And that can make things a little bit faster, especially when you're working with 3D stuff like this. So now we have our final shot. So 
Hopefully that about does it. This was a long one, I know. I apologize for that. There are chapters. And hopefully you know that by now if you've made it this far into the video. And again, this is definitely a love letter to Andrew Kramer. What a guy who's inspired so many people to get into this field. And I thought it'd be a lot of fun to revisit the tutorial that got me into it in the first place. And like I had said before, there were some things I left out on purpose. You can go to his tutorial, which of course I linked in the description, and you can look into how to do that. It's very simple stuff, very easy to pull off in Fusion, given what you know now. If you'd like access to the whole project file, again, that's in the Patreon. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Take care.